Hello everyone. We are very happy to have Professor Ila Patnaik with us today. She is currently a professor at the National Institute of Public Finance and Policy. Her work is on open economy macroeconomics. So basically, she looks at capital flows, foreign exchange market, and so on. Uh, professor Patnaik has been very active in the public policy space, and her work has been the basis of some of the fundamental reforms that we have seen in the financial sector in the last decade. Uh, Professor Patnaik has also been the principal economic advisor under the first term uh, with Prime Minister Modi. And lastly, Professor Patnaik has been a prolific writer and she has been a talk show host as well as communicated to a very broad audience economics in very simple terms. We are very happy to have you, Professor Ila Patnaik, over here. Uh, welcome once again. Thank so, you. as I mentioned already, you have these three very different roles. You work on research, you do policy work, as well as you try to communicate it to a very wide set of audience. How do you manage all these and which one of these do you find the most challenging? Actually, I'm just an economist. And all of these are what an economist does. That's the job of an economist, to do research, to uh, try to influence uh, uh, policy makers on uh, making policy based on evidence. So after and in the process of doing that, I think it's also very important to build consensus, to communicate to people what uh, uh, research shows, how things are moving. And in fact, in a democracy like ours, that's when policies really get made, when there is a lot of public opinion. So I think actually it's just one role. I mean, we all try to do that, but we actually fail. I mean, the last part, most importantly, where you have to communicate it to a wider audience. How do you manage that? I mean, so I've been trying uh, to do that for many, many years now. I think I started writing in 1999, where... Uh, uh, I started writing columns for the Business Standard first, which meant not so much of a lay audience because it's a pink paper. Uh, so I had fortnightly columns there. And then for about 10 years, I wrote columns for the Indian Express. Now, that's a white paper. So, you know, it would always be um, that you have to write such that the lay person understands. And moving from that on to now I write columns for the print uh, and also uh, videos along with my columns every week because, you know, young people read less and watch YouTube more these days. Uh, so I guess it's just a lot of practice. <laughs> I guess we are the TikTok generation, but yeah. Yes, yeah, so so, a lot of practice. Uh, let me move back a little bit because given your background and working with the uh, first um, as a principal economic advisor with, with the Modi government. And so the motto has been that government has no business to be in business. So my question is, since you worked there, uh, how, how much outcome do you see on that front? And if there are like some hiccups we have seen lately, why do you think that such pro-market reforms haven't seen big uptake in the second term of the Modi government? See, fundamentally, uh, we've had a very long history of uh, when the government was in the business of business, when everything it was thought that the state has to do. So whether it was HMT, Air India, you know, various uh, public sector enterprises and uh, there a lot of vested interests develop. And, and that's part of life. That's what happens that when something has been around for many years, it's very difficult to undo those. But we economists try to look at the margin, right? So whatever was there was there. Now, what is it that is changing uh, really is about the margin. What are the new things? Have many new public sector enterprises which are producing, you know, watches and hotels, are they being set up? No. So at the margin, so that's that's my first point, that at the margin, what you do see is actually a change. If you look back at the last, you know, many years, you would say uh, even the UPA had moved away from uh, the Congress after 91, had moved away from the philosophy of uh, the public sector producing hotels and watches. But they could also not undo 
the uh, enterprises that existed, maybe because of unions, maybe because of vested interests of the bureaucracy, of various elements of uh, society, politicians, you know, many elements. So that's my point number one, that at the margin, you will find that actually the Modi administration one and two have stuck to uh, that fundamental philosophy. I think second, uh, you are also seeing disinvestment of Air India. Did you ever think that that would happen in your lifetime? I thought it wouldn't happen in my lifetime. I thought it would just die down. Yeah, and we, you know, kept putting 7,000 crores year after year. So, I think that it takes time to build consensus. It also takes time for the, the government needed to get a majority in both houses of uh, parliament for it to have the confidence to push things through. I think it takes time. What took time for, you know, bad things to be done for so many years will also take time for them to be undone. So you think that was partially the reason, like lack of consensus on the agri market reforms, that if it had played out slightly better, it was a pro-market reform, and maybe the outcome would have been different? I think the, it was a pro-market reform. And I think that, uh, you know, uh, when I look back at 2004, uh, one of the first speeches that Prime Minister Manmohan Singh made was that uh, we need to get away from this pro-cereal policy of uh, uh, in agriculture, that we need to build a national market for agriculture. And, you know, the agriculture needs reforms pretty clearly. And I think a lot of the economists who had worked with the UPA, and I'm talking 2004, uh, said that uh, as incomes change, uh, households needs change and therefore agricultural reform becomes very important because you know you can't just produce the food that you were producing say in the 1960s and focus on that. Now in the 10 year period very little uh, was discussed, very little was pushed forward. So unlike say in the case of Air India where we all kind of we all kind of said yes you know this is a reform that has to happen because there was enough debate, there was enough, uh, also the experiences were such that it, it did uh, get, uh, at least it was on the agenda, though it didn't get done. But I think on agriculture, because of the politics, because of farmer politics, because of Punjab, Haryana, because of those farmers who produce surplus wheat and rice, and they, they like low volatility in, in incomes and they have a loud voice and political influence. It never reached the stage of being discussed, of consensus being created. And unfortunately, perhaps that's one of the reasons why, uh, you know, the government responded by saying, OK, maybe they need to be done later when there is consensus. I mean, sometimes consensus can arrive later on as well, at least. And I'm going back to the first term once again, uh, I'm talking about demonetization. So having seen it completely unfold, and I think a lot of general public would still support the decision, but having seen it unfold, what's your opinion about it? So I, at that time, I was really worried when it first came in. I was really worried that it's going to cause a very, very big shock. Now, being a macroeconomist, uh, being a monetary economist, one feels that uh, withdrawing 85% of the currency is going to give a very, very big shock to the economy. Now, as it played out, I think I was, a, I was, I was overestimating the shock. It was not that big a shock. The economy recovered quickly. For black money, I think a lot more needed to be done. Okay, so for black money, doing demonetization uh, was part of uh, getting rid of corruption, was getting rid of tax evasion. And tax evasion also, I think, requires a more uh, simple uh, and reasonable and lower taxes. So on the front of black economy, I don't think we've gotten rid of black economy and that demonetization 
should have been one of the list. NIPFP has done a lot of work on black money and has always recommended that, you know, there are many taxes like capital gains tax on housing, on, how, you know, capital gains from housing. You don't collect a lot of money because people then, you know, take some value in cash or the market has become very, uh, it's a dirty market. It's not a clean market. So I think a lot more needed to be done. But let me come to my third point. The thing that actually uh, we did not know was going to happen was COVID. And uh, the kind of digital infrastructure that got created during demonetization turned out to be very useful for us. So not, not that we anticipated it. But uh, it did, I think, save a lot of lives, a lot of livelihoods. And so that turned out to be good. So some good, some bad, some not so uh, effective. Some unexpected some upside. Un some unexpected upside, absolutely. So I, I know that you have led uh, the research on the uh, financial sector legislative reforms. And quite a lot of changes that we see in the financial sector has happened since then. So maybe I'll talk a little bit about that, but I'm quoting like one of your comments. You were discussing this report and you said, existing laws in India are rooted in the notion that the state is benevolent. They predate insights from public choice theory, which developed around the idea that public servants are not just maximizing public interest, but are also motivated by private interest. So how much progress has India really made on minimizing these private interests? And I'm asking in a more general setting, not just FSLRC. So uh, what we find when we study regulators is that uh, if you give uh, too much power to regulators, lack of accountability basically, then there is uh, no appellate tribe. Bunal, for example. So one of the uh, things that you, how you create accountability is all, is, you know, to say, give, a, give reasoned orders. You have to do A, B, C, D, and E, how separation of powers inside the regulator happens and that there should be an appellate tribunal that the regulator's orders should not be one all and all, uh, that the regulator just gets away with anything. Now, when you see the difference between regulators who, and I'll not name them, Right, I think everyone knows who we're talking about. Regulators where there is no appellate tribunal versus regulators where there is a, an appellate tribunal. So I'm not saying that uh, the securities uh, appellate tribunal is the best functioning. Many times things, you know, don't, uh, posts have been vacant, meetings don't, haven't happened during COVID and so on. But in a broader scale of things, when there is an appellate tribunal, then the regulator becomes more accountable. That's why it, some progress. So while we've had, we've got SAT, we've all, after FSLRC, you've also seen uh, PFRDA and IRDA, the Pensions Regulatory yes. Authority and the Insurance uh, Regulatory Authority, both, uh, uh, for both uh, SAT has become the uh, appellate uh, tribunal. So some progress, yes. We still don't have RBI there, but. Okay, since you mentioned the Reserve Bank of India, RBI, so I worked with RBI, always like asking questions about them. So in the recent monetary policy, RBI took like a completely different stand from the rest of the world with the expectation there would probably be no spillover whatsoever from the international market. At the same time, US has had the largest inflation in the last four decades. More than India's. More than India's. So yeah, welcome to the club. Hmm. So how do you think about this RBA policy in general? And if you can connect it to the discussions you, you have had during the FSLRC, yeah. is there some reason from there that you can see why? So I think this is uh, what some people would call fiscal dominance, where what's happening is that the government has uh, said that it will borrow more. Uh, and uh, that its debt manager is the RBI, and the RBI now has to try to keep the cost of borrowing low because it remains a debt manager. Uh, it doesn't seem to be a genuinely inflation-targeting central bank anymore, if it ever was, because 
everything pointed towards at least the need to uh, make a clear statement, at least that much. So I'm not even saying that they necessarily had to raise the reverse repo. I'm not saying that uh, they had to say that they were behind the curve because yields have started rising. But at least they had to point towards the fact that, uh, you know, they'll have to start normalizing policy, that rates may go up. They had to indicate that uh, global inflation has gone up, domestic inflation has gone up, uh, global rates may go up. But I think what's really happening is that in their uh, struggle to continue to hang on to their role as debt manager, uh, they've not... Uh, but how different is it from the Fed? I mean, the Fed is not the Treasury manages its debt. I'm saying in terms of like the final outcome. I mean, they have been so far behind the curve on inflation currently. So, right. So I think that uh, first and foremost, the Fed might feel that unemployment is um, an issue and that they have to do a balance between unemployment and inflation. And they may choose to ignore the fact that labor force participation has gone down, which is one of their problems. And then they may choose to do what they are doing, trying to balance between uh, unemployment and inflation. And they have had a situation, so they've had as bad the pandemic has hit them, and they have had a situation where uh, they may you know, have chosen to do that. But they are now indicating that rates will go up. Yes. The Bank of England is also indicating that rates will go up. If I think most central banks are now saying that post-pandemic we need to normalize. Why is RBI not saying that? Right? So that's the difference. I, as I said, it's not necessarily that the Fed should not have expanded when during the pandemic because yeah. during the pandemic everywhere fiscal and monetary policy both were expansionary to support you know economies during the pandemic my point is that when you're coming out of the pandemic you have a clear conflict between uh, keeping the cost of government borrowing low and trying to fight inflation you know what everybody else is doing which is that they are indicating that they will fight inflation, but we are not. We are basically supporting a low cost of body. Now, to go back to your question of how is it related to the research in FSLRC and really why is this happening? So, you know, one way of looking at it could be that, oh, it's just this policy and, RB and these individuals and this MPC. But uh, from our research on FSLRC, there is a fundamental conflict of interest uh, between a debt management role and an inflation targeting role when exactly the situation arises. So that conflict may not be there if, uh, let's say, the debt to GDP ratio is very low and inflation is low. Then there's no conflict. Basically, right? 2015 to 2020. Exactly. Exactly. And then you don't really need to worry. So what was FSLRC worried about? It was worried about exactly a situation like we have now. And what you can have in a situation like this, if it continues and RBI continues to say, we'll be accommodative, we'll be accommodative, we'll be accommodative, is that inflation can get out of hand. And in a globalized world like this, where everybody else is tightening, you let inflation get out of hand very soon it could start reflecting on uh, in the confidence in the rupee. And that means that there could be pressure on the rupee to depreciate. Last six months, money is already, FII money is already going out. Okay. Now that could, if there's a taper tantrum, I'm not saying that there will be, but there's a strong likelihood that there could be not a taper tantrum, but, you know, I don't know, Ukraine, I don't know whether it's, what development, but any shock to the economy, given that if you are not committing to keep inflation low, you could get pressure on the rupee. And then if you start panicking and raising rates then, rather than doing it now in a systematic manner, if you do it then, you will shock the economy into a much worse situation. And that's when you'll hit growth more than you would have hit growth had you started indicating that you are normalizing policy. So 
we are probably a bit behind the curve on the monetary policy. Let's go to the another market, crypto market. Are we behind the curve there as well? So uh, RBI says last week, Deputy uh, Governor in charge of uh, uh, crypto, that we should ban crypto. Wasn't that a Supreme Court uh, ruling that that can't be done? Uh, so that apart, so how are you going to ban crypto? You might ban taking in and taking out uh, money. You might say it is not legal tender. So it's not a means of uh, exchange. It's not legal tender. But how are you going to actually monitor and police people from having accounts, trading. I think it's already happening in a very big way. So my worry is just because you find it very difficult to regulate it, handle it, you don't know whether you should regulate it as a means of exchange or whether you should regulate it as an asset, you say ban it. But I don't think a ban is practical. I don't think banning is going to be something that the government will be able to do or RBI, whoever is, who will be made in charge, maybe some ED, some CBI, somebody, and they'll go running after people who they'll discover have crypto accounts. How many people will they catch? Is it something that can practically be done? And that's why, yes, you're right, behind the curve. But there have been some discussions in this budget. And so... And I'm just thinking in the future, like, if you are thinking of some regulation, hmm. what would it look like? What would the architecture look like? And what would be the role of, let's say, central bank digital currency? So I think central bank digital currency would be back-to-back -back, uh, value, same as the rupee. And the difference would be that in contrast to, say, Paytm money or other digital currencies, that it would be legal tender. Other than that, if it is non-interest bearing, people may still prefer bank accounts because they can do all the transactions. We are already at a retail level. We are already, you know, very far ahead of many countries where we can do digital payments because of payments, payment banks. So, uh, you know, keep crypto to one side because people see crypto typically as an asset, not maybe some for cross-border transactions, but mainly... Uh, at least when you talk to young people who have crypto accounts, they say, okay, you know, I see it as an asset. I put money in. If I'm lucky, uh, it, it, its value will increase. Today, we don't see it as much for, uh, as a means of, uh, as a medium of exchange in India. It's not that we are paying our fees in crypto as you might be allowed to do somewhere in the U.S., what we are typically doing for digital currency, I don't see th that playing the same role. I see that playing a different role, which is as a means of exchange. Because if it's non-interest bearing, if its value is one is to one to the rupee, uh, do you think people who, I mean, what is the incentive to hold uh, the RBI digital currency? Um, its yeah. value is not going to give you anything. Maybe what you can want to do is use it as legal tender. But you know, then again, it comes to the question of will it be wholesale or retail? So if it's retail, then RBA has to open a crore accounts. Uh, the system, uh, there has to be pervasive internet connectivity. The system has to work very fast. So it can't be blockchain because blockchain takes about, you know, 15 minutes or maybe for uh, it to be verified. But uh, it has to be better than what we have today. So it has to be better than my uh, RTGS or more convenient, more convenient somehow. So uh, and the systems also have to be very robust. So you know each bank, you you know banks keep going down, and we have a public sector uh, banking system. Why would I not trust SBI's you know? Why would I, uh, I which also gives me interest on that account? Why would I hold digital currency? So those questions will, I guess, get resolved whether they'll be interest-bearing, whether they'll be retail, whether uh, in uh, there is uh, adequate internet connectivity all over the country so that people are, feel confident of not holding cash and just depending on the digital currency. So let's see. 
the devil lies in the detail. Let me ask you a slightly different question, given your new foray into political economy. You've written a very recent book on the rise of the BJP, uh, where you talk about how it has become one of the largest political parties in the world. So I'm trying to draw some lessons about basically incentives. How do you motivate teams? I guess a large part of the book covers that, motivating team members. So what are the key takeaways from there? I think the biggest takeaway was that uh, BJP is a non-dynastic party. And what's happened with a lot, most, not all, but most other parties, so the, not the communists who are Carter based and ideological, but is that they became uh, controlled by families. So they became like family businesses. So I'm drawing a distinction between giving a ticket in one constituency to a popular family versus uh, the party being family controlled and family dominated. So like a family dominated business. So I think one of the key lessons was that uh, for people to join, feel enthused that they can rise up to the top by their own hard work without uh, sucking up to anybody, without trying to please one family. Uh, that was one uh, very important lesson. The second was that there is this uh, system of having at least three, four generations of leadership where, uh, you know, you'll have about two people at the top. So, you know, whether it was uh, Vajpayee Advani or Modi Amit Shah, or, you know, so there is uh, one who's leading the government and one leading the party, and they're always different. There's a party president who uh, has to, uh, doesn't remain the same party president. It changes. So there are rules about that. And then there is a second level leadership. And at every stage, a new leadership is uh, created. Each generation then comes in so that people see upward mobility. People are motivated. People are motivated to become active at a local level as well, because there is hope that they would uh, be able to represent their region, their community, their uh, profession and uh, that's kind of how I think that's critical that the feeling that by uh, joining and working hard they can move a uh, little bit like saying BJP is pro-market in politics in that sense like it's incentivizing the players correct correct it's not a closed club where what matters is your birth and it's not that you, you know, if you're entitled, you get what you get, otherwise you don't get. So it's pro-market in that way. And pro as a new uh, non-incumbent market also. And as an economist, what are the key takeaways? I'm sure you, you mentioned that you talked to a lot of people uh, within the BJP. So as an economist working on this intersection of politics and economics, what is the final thinking like? Is it really political economy which matters at the end of the day to implement reforms or run the economy in general? Run the absolutely, economy? absolutely. So it is the politics of uh, the party that determine what will happen to uh, the policy framework. So I'll give you a couple of examples. Now you think of the IBC, the bankruptcy court. I mean, other countries have had bankruptcy codes for very long. And we never had a bankruptcy code until the Modi, uh, Modi 1.0, where the bankruptcy code was brought in. Now, what was the bank? What was the lack of a bankruptcy code? The lack of a bankruptcy code was government has politicians control. In, I'll put it in very simple words. Maybe not exactly true. Politicians don't control directly, but government controls and parliament controls. Public sector banks. Public sector banks then give loans to industry and to industrialists. And those industrialists uh, don't, let's say they pay for the money and don't return the loans. And then nothing happens. Even their ownership is not taken away. Right? That was lack of a bankruptcy code. If your politics is that you want to break that nexus of corruption, 
that you want that taxpayer money doesn't go to a few people, you break that. How do you break it? You break it by bringing in laws that say that if you don't return the money you borrowed, then you are going to have to lose the company. Promoters don't just hang on to their companies despite eating up crores, thousands of crores rather, not just crores, thousands of crores. Okay? So that is political, right? It breaks the political nexus between politicians and industry. I'll give you another example. Uh, Jandhan Aadhar. Okay. Now, you had a system uh, of uh, giving, uh, say, Manrega or a lot of a lot of subsidies to the poor, where. Your Prime Minister Rajiv Gandhi had said that there is 85% leakage. That means instead of giving money to six people or five or six people, you were giving money to one person. So you were not reaching to the beneficiaries and a lot of taxpayer money was going waste. And yet, despite four or five years ago, you could have started implementing Aadhaar. In 2012, I led a team at NIPFP. We on cost benefit of Aadhaar, we presented our, uh, the report to the planning commission and uh, though there were some people in the planning commission who was who were keen on pushing it forward, but the government as a whole did not push it, did not. So they let the leakages continue. Why does that happen? Because between the government and the beneficiary are layers of middlemen and those middlemen by then have political influence and they support and they give money and all kinds of things. No, but there were a lot of economists as well who were supporting it. Who were not su not su supporting what? Not the corruption. Nobody. No, was not the corruption, it. but yeah. thinking that this kind of a direct benefits transfer wouldn't work in India. It hasn't worked anywhere. Well, there were also a lot of economists who were saying that you should do direct benefit transfers that it should do cash transfers, which go straight to the beneficiaries. There were a lot of those. So, I mean, there are always people who say, oh, India is different and nothing works in India, but let's not, let's ignore them, okay? Because I don't think that's at all true, right? <laughs> so, let's go to those who said that this should be done. And yet, you know, the discussion about national population register, not UIDI, UIDI did not get money. I mean, the institution, in fact, they they really struggled. They wouldn't get photocopiers. They wouldn't get printers. You know things that were like really in, in less than thousand rupees, less than ten thousand rupees. And this is UPA, which had started it, but then that political support was missing. So once you the regime changed, you did not want all those um, uh, rent-seeking, corrupt individual middlemen uh, to be in between the government and the beneficiary. You get rid of them. So that reform again comes from politics. That's why I would say that, you know, in, that's why politics interests me that why, how does government policy get made? Uh, a lot of work, your work has been on incentives and building institutions. So this is really my last question for today. But as like one of the top economists from India, uh, I mean, we need more economists. So, uh, because in general, I think we have very few of them given the challenges we face and given the institutional requirement for that. So what would be your suggestion to people thinking about venturing into economics or thinking of joining this profession in the long run? So I think my biggest learning uh, has been that when we study economics, uh, we need to study laws be we, because laws are the instruments through which policies actually get made. And sometimes there's a big difference between uh, what is in the economist in intends to do and how the laws translate that into reality. So the laws is number one. And second, along with that, we need to look at the politics, study the politics, uh, understand uh, what uh, pushes, incentivizes politicians to push for certain policies. So an economist uh, needs to do both. 
economics and other subjects like law and politics as well. It was a pleasure talking to you. Thank you, Ila, so much Thank for you. your time. Thank you. Have a nice day.